Hey there, level two game devs. I'm Charles, and in this video, we're gonna talk about working with data and data structures in Unity. This video is a collaboration with Jason Story, and our goal is to give you a better understanding of how you can structure your own game's data in a way that's easier to work with and extend. When making games, one of the core building blocks you'll find yourself using is data. Data is nebulous and unconnected. It usually doesn't have meaning until you structure it into something that tells you the relationship between it and what it represents. Here's an example of some unstructured data in Unity. These data structures, which is where the name struct comes from, by the way, are meant to represent things. They're often also known as records, as they're similar to a file recording facts about something. In fact, another name for a record is a POD, which stands for plain old data, which brings us full circle. Here's an example of structured data in Unity. Structured data, like these records, are easier to reason about, share, and store. So records are one type of data structure, which contains related information that you care about. Usually though, you care enough about structuring your data because you intend to have a number of things that match the same structure. Probably the most common form of data structure is the array. The array has a similar job, but instead represents a logical collection of elements. Here's an example of a data array in Unity. This is a way of storing data in contiguous memory blocks. In short, instead of logically grouping your compound data, like with the record example, you can store the data in lists and access the elements by ID, just like this, for example. This kind of data management can be very performant, and this contiguous memory concept is actually a core part of Unity Dots, which is aimed at high-performance use cases. But it can get very unwieldy and hard to reason about. The reality is that in software, everything is a trade-off, and a common concern is where do you focus on performance versus where do you focus on making the code faster to develop, easier to debug, and more resistant to change. In general though, a rule I like to follow is to ask myself what the core loop of my application is. If something is run rarely, like the loading of objects into memory at the start of the application, or changes rarely, like altering the stats of an existing weapon at runtime, I usually favor making my application easier to modify, maintain, and debug until performance becomes an issue, if it ever even does. Following the Pareto principle, there are usually one or two changes that will have a big impact on improving performance, and those big things are usually in the core loop. So what does it actually look like to structure our data using arrays? Before we look at that, if you're interested in this type of content, then I'd like to invite you to sign up for the Level 2 Game Dev Newsletter. Once a month, we'll send you an email with curated content that's designed to help you take your game dev career or hobby to the next level and help you keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the industry. We'll share content from Infallible Code, Thousand Ant, and some of our friends in the space, like Jason Story. If that sounds good to you, visit the link in the description and sign up today. All right, so what does it actually look like to structure our data using arrays? Well, here's an example in Unity. Now we have data that is logically grouped into records. We can add new entries and access their elements by array index. There's one small problem though. A data structure's job is to store and maintain elements. In this case, our weapons. Whatever's handling the data structure is taking on all the responsibility of managing that data. So why is this a problem? Well, let's say I gave you a list of 100 weapons to add to the game. How would you do it? I assume you'd begin typing out all that information. Well, let's say I change my mind and give you 100 different weapons. I want you to replace the original 100 I gave you. <laughs> Off you go, right? Are you done yet? Okay, I changed my mind. Put the original 100 back. As you can see, having a way to store and index data is one problem. Managing that data is another. This is where we get to the difference between data structures and objects. Before we solve the problem of filling out the data, let's solve the second problem. I asked you to fill out one set of items, then another, then go back to the original. The problem is that because you're changing the elements of the data structure, you're making destructive changes. In other words, putting in new data destroys the old data. You have no way to go back to the old data without redoing all of that data entry. This is because to you, this specific set of items is an important distinction. It's something worth naming and storing. So let's fix that. This may seem like a pointlessly small script, but it's surprisingly powerful. 
In our hierarchy, we can now comfortably distinguish between different types of weapons. And despite all these changes, our original code actually doesn't look all that different, as you can see here. Now, instead of dealing with the data structure directly, we have decided that weapons are a concept that we care about, and so have made it a dedicated object. Which brings us to the difference between objects and data structures. Data structures simply store data. In general, they're considered passive. In contrast, objects add behavior to that data, allowing you to perform operations and make it easier to use and work with. Say, for example, a common request was to ask which items a player could afford, like in a shop, for example. We could use this snippet of code here. This brings us to an interesting point. Now that we're wrapping our data structure in an object, a weapons object, we should no longer be talking to the data structure at all. Any operations we need to perform should be things that we choose to allow or expose on the weapons object itself. So let's make a few small changes. Now our data structure is private. We can't access the items directly. Instead, we can ask for data by calling public methods on our weapons object, which are helpfully listed by our IntelliSense and called like any other method. So we now have a way to talk about weapons, what they are, what kind of questions you can ask about them, etc. We've solved the problem of creating different weapon objects and being able to drop different ones into our script and swap them out without having to redo any work of filling out the elements. The other problem still exists though. We still actually have to fill them in. This is gonna be a bit of a nuisance if we have 50 to 100 items we wanna create. Now we get to another interesting property of our weapons object. We've encapsulated the concept of weapons. So now we don't know anything about them other than the methods that they expose to us to interact with. In short, we've completely separated the creation of data from the use of data. This gives us a lot of flexibility. For example, a quick way to solve our problem is to use a spreadsheet. So here we have a standard Google Sheets document. We can add as many items as we want, share it around and have it edited, have a lot of different sheets. But how do we get that data into Unity? Well, one of the common spreadsheet formats is CSV. So let's make a version of our weapons object that knows what a CSV is, as we can see here. Now the actual lines of code don't really matter here. That's not the point of the exercise. The only important thing to note is the top line. CSV weapons derives from weapons and is a version of the weapons class that's CSV based. Over in the inspector, it doesn't look all that different from the original weapons object. Only now, instead of having to manually type out all the elements, if we right click and press load, it'll automatically populate our items for us. And what code do we have to change in our example script to work with our new CSV weapons? None whatsoever because a CSV weapons is just a different type of weapons object, but it's still just a normal weapons object at the heart of it. So in summary, we've gone from a loose collection of data to structured data into records, to grouping those records into a data structure called an array, to wrapping that array in an object that adds operations to the data and handles interacting with it. Why go to all that effort? Well where we are now, if we want to completely change the data, like for instance, if we wanted real data for production and test data for development, we can do that. If we want to use a different method of storing and changing that data, like a spreadsheet, we can. What if instead of a spreadsheet, that data came from, I don't know, a web service, maybe even a database? What if we had database weapons, CSV weapons, web service weapons, JSON weapons, XML weapons, heck, even scriptable object weapons? It doesn't matter. We can make that decision about where the data comes from completely separately from how we use it. The data is now handled by an object that, no matter where it comes from, makes it look like it's just an in-memory collection that we can interact with. That is the definition of the repository pattern. That's what a repository is. It's taking the various interactions that surround data and separating the request for info about them from the source. This is why, in general, the question of what is the best way to store my data or should I use JSON is not as important a decision as people think. What matters far more than where you store your data is if your architecture allows you to change that decision to best suit your needs without causing you a lot of work or headaches. As it stands now, we can change, swap, and add as many new sources of weapons as we like. All the while, the rest of our application doesn't care at all. This is not only what the repository pattern is, but why it's important. Imagine going back to our early examples. 
Imagine having 5,000 weapons in your game. Now, imagine having to change some of them. There's still a lot more to cover with the repository pattern, most notably the editing of data. This is a different problem and is usually done by combining the repository patterns with another pattern called the unit of work. But we'll cover that in another video. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you'll definitely want to sign up for the Level 2 Game Dev Newsletter using the link in the description. Also, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you to all of my supporters, and a special shout out to Alwyn Caravilla, Do2, Dustin, Jennifer Irwin, Nicholas Monter, Pichyag Bungo, Saraf Chatterjee, Umet Sarin, Usaf Ali Kassel, and Uriser. Thank you guys.